Knowledge is power. And this is powerful stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Week at 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with your host, Jen Solis. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. The phone lines are open at 731-1230. That's 731-1230 or toll free. Toll free. 1-866-820-5528. That's 1-866-820-KLAV. Now, let's bring on the host. Here is Jen Solis. Hi, this is Jennifer Solis, and um, this is Nevada Cannabis News. To the right of me, I have Kurt Dukach and William B.J. Beach Baker. Uh, Raymond Fletcher is on assignment and not in the studio this evening, so we'll start talking about our local news. Well, we have uh, a guest right on away. the phone also, too. Oh, we, we do have, have uh, a guest on the phone. It's Mark Trebeek. Hello. It's been a long time, uh, Nevada. I've been uh, busy doing a bunch of things, and I'm glad to finally be back and uh, helping out Nevada Cannabis News Hour with the news and, and uh, advice that it needs for cannabis reform. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, well, today we had a, a couple of meetings, and they're, they're the city uh, land use proposal, but more importantly, the state meeting. The state meeting today for medical use and to limit the canopy size or not limit the canopy size uh, went on today, and the... Um, the official said right at the beginning, we are not going to limit the canopy. And we are, you know, so anything else that was said after that was basically just kind of almost grandstanding in a way, I feel. Um, because right at the beginning, they said, we are not going to limit the canopy. Then we had Tick Seegerbloom saying, Thank you for not limiting the canopy. We want to start a robust program out. We want to have, um, we want to let the free market dictate uh, who is going to fail and who is going to succeed. And yeah, the uh, the first three speakers on the subject were some of the heavy hitters in, in the state. We had Tick Seegerbloom who put the bill in, uh, you know, introduced the bill and helped pa pass it. Then we had Jacqueline Holloway, the director of business licensing for Clark County. And then Dan, Dan Schwinhorfen. Schwinhorfen, yeah, who's uh, on the Pahrump City Council. On the, from the Pahrump City Council. And all of them said, we are not limiting. <laughs> we are not limiting the canopy in Nevada. We are going to let free market dictate I have to say I was a little surprised on how this came out procedurally because when I saw the initial uh, publication from uh, the state of Nevada on this issue, uh, it suggested that they had actually uh, done some analysis of it and were afraid of a wild oversupply of product, which could have been a concern. And then, as it turns out, in the hearing, the, the numbers that they came up with uh, were just out of their, well, some orifice that we don't need to talk about, but huh. it's, it's, it's really, they just pulled out of thin air. And that, that's surprising. That's, um, that's not what we're used to with the state of Nevada, which has proceeded very carefully and considerately on all aspects of it. So uh, I'm glad that they realized that the, the basis for even suggesting this limit uh, was no basis at all. Well, you know, and, and the other thing is, is that, um, as many applications as they received, they didn't say whether those applications, um, how, you know, what kind of points they got, whether they were viable applications. They just said, oh, we received, you know, two to three times that amount. But what they didn't say was, oh, we received two to three times that amount, but we haven't vetted them yet, so we don't know how much are really viable. Again, it was just there was no foundation for the claim that there was a, even a potential for oversupply. It was guesswork and suspicion uh, without analysis uh, or, or real information on it. So um, I'm glad they came to the decision to uh, not proceed any decision based on lack 
uh, such a profound lack of information. Well, and you know, and that, and that's just the thing. When they when they originally came up with those numbers, they had no idea about the number or the potential um, the potential new card holders. They they we kind of have an idea following everybody else's lead in in the different states in the United States here, but with the reciprocity that throws a wild card in that that other places just don't even have to handle or manage i mean only with colorado and their um adult recreational use do you have any type of idea what's going to go on and from and from that model there were shortages there's still shortages today they're still not back up to where they need to be indeed there were shortages in, in washington too so uh definitely Look at um, we are all want to be concerned about uh, maintaining a viable economy in the cannabis industry, and we all want to be concerned about ensuring that there's not diversion. But the best way you can train wreck a, an economy is to short supply, and therefore create an incentive to turn to the underground market. So uh, this is this is a good result for Nevada today, and I'm hoping that before the state or, or any uh, governmental body issues uh, such a suggestion that they, they do their homework. As was suggested at the hearing today, there were several comment, uh, comments that took the point of, do your homework. Let's have the system in place. Let's develop the data and then determine uh, whether there's any public policy uh, interest to be served uh, through uh, any restrictions on production. Yeah, and, you know, and, and for our listeners who don't know you, Mark is, has been working on the medical marijuana and in the medical marijuana industry for a number of years. He's a lawyer um, from California that is heavily involved with the medical marijuana industry. Um, and you also have activists, um, activist um, family members in Michigan, don't you, Mark? Yeah, yes, my brother uh, uh, litigated a case that went all the way up to the Cal uh, to California, the Michigan Supreme Court, Tarbeek versus City of Wyoming, in which he won, establishing the right of uh, medical cannabis patients to grow their own pursuant to the state law in any town or county in that state uh, without uh, harassment or inter interference from uh, retrograde uh, governmental entities. Well, that's uh, yeah, and that's and that's really great. It's, it was a great step forward um, for the state, for sure. But um, the, back to our potential cap, our cultivation cap. After all of the heavy hitters got up there, then we see, and, and you know, it, it's it's like people aren't paying attention to what's going on, and they're only listening or looking for their next uh, opportunity to speak. Um, you know, they they said we're not ruling on this we're not limiting the cap you know yeah, just no let, intentions of, of we have of no limiting. intentions of it and there were still people getting up there we don't want this limit cap because this so and so and this and this and it was just like were you not listening to the first five minutes or first 10 minutes of this meeting um, it's interesting in 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 the law uh we have this uh philosophy that when the judge is uh, speaking on your side and you're winning shut up exactly. <laughs> People weren't getting it today. Yeah, and the people were getting up there again talking about all the different strains and what they do and all, you know, it's it, it's all stuff that really was not even a topic of the meeting. Yeah. yeah, but you know, unfortunately, when they put it, when they put out public comments for meetings, everybody's going to have their three minutes of say, um, you know, whether it's just to, whether it's just to say good job, thank you, and that would have been appropriate, or is going to say, you know what? That, well, I'm going to grandstand for three minutes and I'm going to tell all about my business and then, you know, hopefully somebody in the audience can hear me and, you know, they're going to come up and pay me a million bucks or something. <laughs> well, there are there are the several approaches in uh, uh, that people take to public comments. And, and public comment is always a good thing, all right? It's, it's democracy in action. So, That's well, great. You know, I just mm -hmm. want to make sure that we're all... We're all clear that we support the uh, free access to our government officials, but people come to this with uh, with several agendas, and they, to me, they fall into one of three categories. One is, uh, I've got nothing better to do, and I'm going to uh, exercise my uh, temporal mandibular joint uh, by speaking because people will hear me, and that means I exist, and and it doesn't matter what I say. Um, there are people who come in with a specific agenda. Uh, they want to uh, either 
profit or or shape it pursuant to a a specific agenda and then there are uh, people sort of a of a bent that um, they I'm not sure if it's they want to profit or shape it as much as they want to see what happens see what rise they get from the other participants in it uh, for whatever their agenda might be and the important thing for activists to keep in mind in this thing is whenever we have an opportunity to speak on the issue of cannabis we want to be very very focused we want yes. to be focused on what the issue is who the speakers are and what we can do to advance the overall agenda that we want to advance we have to have an agenda and if you keep that in mind then then we have pretty good comments and what happens a lot and, and particularly in our industry is that uh, people aren't used to focusing their comments in that way so it just kind of looks all over the place unfortunately it does and i mean i thought about getting up and speaking and 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 i was just like after the first I don't know, 20, 30 minutes. I was just like, you know what? Any, I, anything that I have had, I would have had to say has already been said very succinctly by someone else. Um, or, or they were long winded, <laughs> but it still was a variation of my message. And, and the only message that I would have had would be, uh, thank you. <laughs> indeed. Yes. Indeed. I didn't even speak at all. I was on the phone and I, uh, oh my goodness. I decided not to speak uh, because they had stated their position very clearly. But I did listen um, because I did want to, when they, when they stated their position, it, it let me know right away that they hadn't done their homework. I mean, they, they had this hearing about whether to do it, and then their first comment was basically, we're not doing it. So, um, Well, you know, I actually knew that this was going to happen. I knew that this was going to happen because what what was going on is that in the in the original bill they said that they're going to need X amount of space for this, and so it went out there that, to the community. You know, this is the, the amount of space that we need, and for them to do anything else at this point, like limit or not limit or when everything, it required a public hearing. Um, I I too was surprised that um, they didn't just cancel the meeting because everything was said, but they needed everybody to know what they were doing, that they were not going to limit the size. And so therefore it did require some type of public hearing or comment or, or a chance for the public to speak. And of course we had the police officers get up there and say, well, you know, we need to limit this because we need to have control of it. And then the other people got up and said, well, look at it this way. If you limit that, then the black market's going to be uh, larger and you will have no control. Yeah. The point was made many times that these people that are getting into this business and the people who put in applications for for cultivation have spent upwards, you know, some of them in multi millions of dollars putting this application together and 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 their business plan and they're planning on this and that. These are not the type of people who are going to risk these licenses that they put all this effort and all this money into to divert a little bit out the back door to make a little extra cash. These are legitimate business people who are in this to do it legally. Otherwise, they wouldn't be going through this process. I mean, if they wanted to sell out the back door, they why do you need a license? I think the best uh, point was made uh, uh, very similar to that, which was, look, if the state has a, a vetting process, a, a ranking process on it, and what the state needs to do is use that ranking process to make sure that the most qualified, honorable, uh, upstanding groups are uh, afforded the registrations and apply, without regard to limits, apply the the stringent vetting criteria that the state already has well, and that's going to take care of the people who are going to uh, be uh, subject to diverting anyway exactly and not only that the state has no idea how much of those two to three times uh you know cultivations will actually survive that process mm -hmm. yeah there's always a, a crop shrinkage uh and failures another good point made uh, during the uh, well, no. My presentation was was uh, the the number of businesses that generally fail within the first year. So you're going to have fall. Well, off. there's that too. But what I'm talking about is that the state set aside this stringent vetting process, 
and they said this is what you know this is what we want from everybody now in reading through those applications and and ranking them there are some that are are going to be not good enough right off the bat Mm -hmm. yes and then there are some that are going to fail within the first year and then you know then people you know it'll fall off and so the free market's going to part of it is the vetting process is going to is going to weed out some <laughs> but uh-huh. then you have uh then you have just the free market process after that that will weed out any anybody else that is really weak or um that can't survive um you know can't, can't survive in in this world another good point i heard was uh the fact that Throughout this whole application process, they said that they want you to show that you have room to grow, that you're not going to have to change up and move to another building because you outgrow yourself after the first year because you don't have you don't have room to expand within your location. So if you put in for a 10,000 square foot facility and you're not using all of that yet, and that's kind of your plan and room to grow so that you, as you get bigger and more established, you increase your canopy inside of your building. They're, they're just taking the square footage of the building and not even looking at any of that. Again, the data was bogus. And, yeah. And they, they, it never should have been published in the first place because the data would, would, it was bogus. But I, on this point, I do want to um, take um, uh, the minority report uh, analysis here okay. for a moment, all, all right. right? Just uh, so we can have a, uh, a discussion on it, which is the concept of of whether, in fact, it does serve a public policy at some point. If the data does show that there was is a policy or would be a policy served by limiting the amount of ap- number of applicants or whatever. Let me give you this scenario. Okay. You got a scenario where there's where there's uh, the, the the demand is uh, meeting the supply and you have a, a rough equilibrium, the prices are stable, uh, business is doing great uh, in the state of Nevada, uh, and the state uh, just keeps on pumping out and pumping out and pumping out registrations uh, because people figure that they can uh, have the better mousetrap, and they come in and uh, prices begin to fall dramatically such that uh, you're having a, a potential series of failures that could then impact supply because as we know markets can be manipulated through such things does and this is a question it's a question worth seriously com- contemplating is at some point if the data warrants it is it um, is it appropriate to consider whether there should be limits on production and what those limits should look like well, you know, that's really interesting, but we're going to go on a break and we're going to contemplate that while we're on a break and hopefully have a, you know, have the beginnings of an answer when we get back. Okay, Mark? Awesome. The Vaughn Dank Group offers turnkey solutions for all your cannabis needs, bringing transparency and responsibility to a young budding industry. Helping patients by producing the cleanest, safest, and most potent medicines and infusibles possible. The Von Dank Group is a design, management, and consulting corporation with over 30 years of industry experience and knowledge of the dispensary, edibles, infusible kitchen, and large-scale cultivation of cannabis manufacturing facilities. Let the Von Dank Group help you grow your cannabis business from seed to green. www.vondank.com you're listening to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour, produced by We Can, the wellness education cannabis advocates of Nevada. We Can is a 501c3 nonprofit. If you're interested in sponsoring us, donating, or advertising on this radio show, please contact our advertising department at 702 218 5226 or Kurt, K U R T, at WeCan702.org. Las Vegas Hempfest is here, October 4th, with live performances from Burn Ass. Yeah, welcome to the Wax Room. Baby Bash. Cypress Hills Send Off. Dub C. Marlon Asher. New Kingston. And a surprise performance from the LBC. Two joints in the afternoon. 
50 bands, DJs, speakers, and comics. All at the Las Vegas Hemp Fest, October 4th. Get your tickets now at all Diversity Tattoo and Smoke Shop locations and at LasVegasHempFest.com. That's LasVegasHempFest.com. Brought to you by Dr. Reef. All right. You know what that sound is? It's not Mark on the phone. It's our 420 moment. Um, before we go back to talking about uh, Canopy Libbits, we're going to talk about Willie Nelson as a weekend celebrity 420 moment honoree for September 23rd. Um, Willie Nelson is 81 years old and he credits his longevity, longevity to smoking cannabis. He stopped using alcohol and tobacco decades ago. Good for him. Um, and he came out of the medical marijuana or the marijuana closet before it was really fashionable and politically correct. Uh, his openness came, al- uh, you know, came out as charming and naive, um, as if he didn't know that cannabis was illegal, and he couldn't figure out why we're st- uh, sometimes other people were so upset. Willie was and still is making political statements that there's nothing wrong with smoking marijuana. So there are two issues that have always been the focus of Willie's political attention, helping family farmers remain on the land, on their land, and legalizing marijuana. What yeah. else what else have you got on Willie? Well, he's always been one of the one of the biggest supporters of uh Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. Uh you know, so uh we just recently had a new chapter of Las Vegas normal open up out here. So, and I know Willie would be proud. Yeah, would. Uh, Willie Hugh Nelson was born April 29th, 1933. And he's an American country music singer and songwriter. He is also an author, a poet an actor and an activism uh, or an activist. Um, so our 420 moment today is for Willie Nelson. Good for you, Willie. I got to tell you, there are a number of people that I'm familiar with who would, of a conservative country bent that uh, took a different take on cannabis when he came out as a proponent of it. So, you know, he can change minds. People can change minds by coming out. That's true. And That's he's true. living proof that it that it's not dangerous. I mean, he's 81 years old and still going strong. So. That's true. So back to your question, Mark. Before we went on break, um, this is Mark Terbeek we're talking about. He's a lawyer and activist uh, met with the medical marijuana industry in California. Um, Mark asked a question. If at some time that it was determined that uh, the market, you know, now that it's going to cost, you know, X amount of dollars to grow this marijuana and you're going to sell it at below market cost to survive, would it make sense to limit the market, um, limit the limit the number of cultivation licenses. Well, you know, I kind of think that actually at some point that it would. With market saturation, prices are going to drop, and then businesses are going to fail. Um, we do have we do have. You know, we should take care of this industry, and in taking care of this industry, these people that have been pioneers in this in this field, and have put in millions of dollars forth, um, you know, don't deserve to have the market fail because it's soft, and and because it it becomes artificially so. I'm going to give you an, a hypothetical, and this is a hypothetical that unfortunately is all too pre, uh, present in our current economic system. And it's one of the reasons I, uh, when I saw the initial uh, uh, publication about limiting uh, the production, I was I was open to it. It's the concept of, uh, at some point, uh, a very wealthy uh, industrialist who's interested in cannabis comes in and starts getting all these registrations and floods the market with cheap cannabis, driving other operators out of business, and then eventually consolidating the market uh, into uh, his or herself uh, in contravention to the anti-monopoly spirit of the law. Um, it's just one of those things that we should keep in mind. Now, let's be clear, the state of Nevada didn't have any data or any foundation or any factual or logical foundation for even suggesting limits at the before the first registration was even issued. But it's a worthy question to keep in mind uh, because we do want to maintain, a, in my opinion, we do want to maintain a healthy industry for those people who invested in it at the beginning. And uh, people shouldn't be, business people shouldn't be subjected to hardship uh, 
through um, an uncontrolled growth and uh, softening of the market that drops prices. That's just my philosophy on it. Something to keep an eye on. Yeah, it is. You know, interesting enough, it is. It is something to keep an eye on. Um, you know, in the future. But I think that in this first year, even if they put like a moratorium on bringing any new cultivation facilities or new production facilities online until we can see what's going to happen with this, it may be a smarter idea. I, I know that it's that they say once every. Uh, year they have a 10-day window to apply but m maybe mark i think the answer may be in this first year to see how many people fall off how many people fail how many people just don't even open and then uh, gauge whether they're going to limit next year's numbers indeed i agree i mean it's way too premature to even talk about it now given that there's zero data to 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 even have an intelligent discussion about it, and not one registration has even been issued. That's true. Speaking um, of registration. Speaking of <laughs> registration, this is a great segue. Yeah, today today is National Voter Registration Day. Oh, we have really strict guidelines here in Nevada that say that you have to register to vote so many weeks before the actual voting time. So today is, uh, what is today? This is the last day to register or is the last day? Oh, the last October day, October 4th, 4th is the last day to register. So you need to register before Hempfest. So, I was going to say, you took the words out of my mouth, <laughs> register on the way to Hempfest. <laughs> That's right. Um, we do have to uh, register, um, last day to register is October 4th. Um, there is an online registration is October 14th is the last day to register to vote electronically. Um, and then early voting happens October 18th through 31st. Uh, and, and so people need to make sure that they get out and they register to vote between, uh, before October 4th for sure exercise your your privilege that's right don't just complain about what's happening out there get out there and you know do something use about your it. voice and and change it if you don't like it well we have more local news north las vegas approved zoning permits for medical marijuana um medical pot cultivation spots uh as it were um Last Wednesday night, uh, North Las Vegas unanimously approved zoning permits for two medical marijuana cultivation facilities. Uh, one is on Synergy Street, and the other one is going to be on El Campo Grande Avenue. Um, they got zoning permits to approve to allow production of edibles. Also, El Campo did. And the business said it's going to only produce medical marijuana oil that will be given to dispensaries, which it will use for production of edibles. Um, there was only one concern citizen there and it was about the smell, but with as many, um, you know, HVAC and, and, um, you know, dampening industry that they have going on that, that, that shouldn't be, it shouldn't be really an issue. Shouldn't be an issue anyway. This and is these, a flower. These North Las Vegas facilities are not the ones that are in apex. These are within the city proper. And so that's why they had. Uh, that's why they had these hearings for zoning permits for these because everybody that applied in Apex was going to basically get um, um, tentative approval, you know, pending the state's application process. Yeah, basically, uh, uh, I, I like that approach. That's actually a sensible approach from a government standpoint. Now, Apex is out there. Um, it doesn't really impact any potential residential or other commercial areas. It's pretty much been designated as a cannabis development spot. Uh, so there was a, it was appropriate to have public hearings. And uh, what it showed is that the opposition to this is weak, uh, that the showings required by the no city of North Las Vegas and other municipalities are strong, and it addresses any reasonable concerns uh, about that. So I think that was a good thing. I think it was a good thing for sure. Uh, me too. So, the next thing we want to talk about is: Did you see the? Did you see the anchor, the Alaskan anchor um, mark that said "pluck it" on a uh, on live TV? I missed that. <laughs> I missed that. Well, um, th there is uh, Charlo Green. Uh, she was a she was a reporter, you know, for a local for a local news station and she had an Alaskan cannabis club in 
in Alaska that is operating in a gray market area. Well, she's going to do a story and she's doing a story and then like halfway through or almost all the way through the story, she realizes that she's doing a story on herself. <laughs> and and what'd she say, Kurt? She said, pluck it. Well, I that's not what quit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. So off- she quit right on the air. She yeah, quit she did. Right she's- on the air. And she ended her segment with this. Now, everything you've heard now after everything you've heard is why I, the actual owner of Alaska Cannabis Club, will be dedicating all of my energy toward fighting for freedom and fairness, which begins with legalization of marijuana here in Alaska. And as for this job, well, not that I have a choice, but pluck it, I quit. <laughs> yep, and she walked right off the air. And so then the director's <laughs> news statement right after there said, We sincerely p- apologize for the inappropriate language used by our KTAV a reporter during this live presentation on the air tonight. The employee has been terminated. She terminated somebody who quit. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Good. By the way, by the way, you're fired. That's right. No, great. Now I can go collect unemployment. Thank you. <laughs> so more in the news in Alaska. Uh, Alaska Marijuana Legislation Initiative. Uh, this is reported by CN staff. Uh, as Alaska has two months left to sway their voters, uh, the dueling groups in support and opposition of ballot measure to legalize tax and regulate recreational mar- uh, marijuana in Alaska are ramping up their campaigns. Uh, so uh, backing the initiative, the campaign to regulate marijuana like alcohol in Alaska gave insight to an upcoming advertising campaign and a new website to be, to be unveiled in early September. Well, you know, this isn't the first time that Alaska has uh, legalized cannabis in their state. Uh, it was legalized, I think, in the late 80s, and then it was uh, re, um, I don't know, re, it made illegal again. Yeah. Recriminalized. Recriminalized. Right. Oh, okay. So, I don't even want to say that word, criminalized. Yeah. So on November 4th, Alaskans will cast their votes on ballot measure two which is the initiative which would legalize recreational use of marijuana for adults aged 21 and older and levy a tax of $50 per ounce uh, pot. So should it pass, the eight-page initiative would leave much of the regulation-making process in the hands of the state. The state would have nine months to craft these regulations, including labeling, health, safety, guidelines, security requirements for marijuana businesses. So it looks like Alaska might be going through a, a similar situation like Nevada just did, but with full legalization and compared to just medical sure and you know and, and i guess that they already have uh cannabis clubs in there uh, according to the, what charo green charo green's um a company mm. uh was was a dispensary all right we've got some news out of california next uh, riverside county marijuana cultivation ban could be delayed until november Okay, there is an ordinance that is intended to target large-scale commercial grows and it's being revised to include an exemption for medical marijuana patients. There, there's a vote on an ordinance that spells out criminal penalties for growing marijuana in Riverside County, and it could be delayed until November as officials try to carve out an exemption for medical marijuana patients. And that's good because, you know, you don't want to make people that are growing legally suddenly illegal. Um, you know, and make sure that their grows are continue to be legal so that they can uh, so that they can have access to their medicine. Um, it just basically talks about how marijuana is legal for patients, but technically it's illegal in the county's unincorporated areas. Um, so basically co- code enforcement would have to deal with them. Mm-hmm. I, I got a good one coming out of California. Here's here's a here's a business that I definitely next time I'm in Los Angeles is I'm gonna go by and check out. There's a uh, new pizza joint opening up in L.A. Stoned Oven Gourmet Pizzas. And Have yes, you had it, one of those, Mark? <laughs> not yet. Okay. Looking yeah, forward to it. They're offering an unconventional pie selection: marijuana laced pizzas. That's right. You heard it. They're uh, they're proving a uh, double meaning for the company's name. The pizzeria break, bakes the medicinal marijuana right into your favorite pizza at the price of just ten dollars. 
in accordance with <laughs> laws, of course. Each six-inch pizza contains 250 milligrams of ethanol-extracted tetrahydrocannabinol, otherwise known as THC, concentrate or the stuff that gets you high. The company sells the six-inch personal pizzas, which are available for delivery to medical marijuana dispensaries scattered around California and lists the locations on its website. So you know what I just heard? A dime bag to your door. <laughs> well, this is an interesting thing because uh, you can get the munchies uh, as you're curing your munchies. How does that work? Uh, I think it's a never-ending process. Perpetual munchies. I think that's meant to sell more and more and more pizzas. For uh, sure. I would definitely partake. Well, back in the news, uh, back in the... <laughs> yeah, give me a large Cheech and Chong, please. <laughs> <laughs> back in the news, um, we have a story that we did a couple of weeks ago out of uh, Seattle, Washington. All of the tickets that have been issued by that single police officer, what was it, like 80 tickets or something? Or oh, no, they wrote 80% 80 of all yeah. the tickets um, for smoking in public or, you know, for joints or, or whatever else. Um, that all of those people are going to have their tickets dropped. He's dropping all the tickets issued by the public use of medical marijuana for the first seven months of the year because most of them were issued by a single police officer who disagrees with the legal pot law. So, as I said, I, I said that, I, you know, if I were those people that I would go in and fight it for sure. Um, it just seems like this guy keeps uh, turning or, or was pushing it his own personal agenda. Yeah, exactly. They were pushing their own personal agenda and they weren't basically they weren't following the law or the, they were following the letter of law, not the intent, really. So yeah. that's our news out of Washington as far as that is concerned. Um, we have more hemp fest tickets to give away so if you're our fifth caller you will get a pair of hemp fest tickets our call-in number is 702-731-1230 or 866-820-5528 call in for the pair of hemp fest tickets now all right i got a little news out of colorado this is a little fun one here okay what's up uh denver area veterans given free marijuana at an unusual event how much free pot did they give out? And he, well, this was an event targeted at veterans, and they handed out free marijuana to hundreds of people on Saturday, including edibles and med medicinal versions of the plant, all in an effort, organizers say, was designed to help vets in need. So, so it doesn't say how much they handed out, but it says that they were handing it out to veterans throughout the whole day. Well, that's awesome. See, we need to do something like that here in Las Vegas. So if anybody's got any extra extra medication, you can bring it over to my house. <laughs> well, you know, we I'll give it out. We've had talks like that where maybe at like one of these meetings that, you know, patients would hand out a free, uh, you know, a free, you know, joint to if you're a patient, you can show your card, but we just we don't have the <laughs> I don't know. to do that. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, it borders it borders on that gray area that I'm just not you know, we, we were going to discuss. Oh, maybe this is a good one for you, Mark. Um, we were discussing. Somebody said that they wanted to um, donate some medication to the nonprofit and um, and that we could we could raffle it off. OK, no. now is raffling it off selling it? Because when people buy a ticket, they have an expectation of they may get the medication, they may not. And of course, this would be the licensed patients only. Um, my argument to them, to you know, to our board members was, well, if it's a five dollar raffle ticket and they're getting and they're getting like twenty dollars worth of medication or even fifty dollars well, worth of medication that they're not even paying paying market price but number two they have no uh no expectation of actually getting the medication it it could just be you know that maybe they are maybe they aren't so what do you think mark well there are two uh cities <clears throat> that have ordinances specifically prohibiting that which is north las vegas and the city of las vegas both of which prohibit uh any mechanism by which cannabis is given away so the giving of it for the purposes of a raffle might run afoul of it uh, the um, raffle ticket uh, being a fraction of the price of the value of the cannabis might be deemed in essence a giving it away 
So I think there's probably going to be uh, some concern about that. I would have some concern about that uh, from a violation standpoint from the city of Las Vegas or the city of North Las Vegas requirements. So <clears throat> I would suggest that a actual registrant not do that. Well, what what if we were to take like our our paid membership li- uh, list, uh, which are which are patients, and randomly select, you know, like a drawing of paid members and give it out, which you know, in turn, this isn't a raffle. They didn't buy that. That you know, they didn't they didn't have any expectation of this. Would th- could that be considered? Here's what I, here's what I would suggest. I would suggest that a um, a, p- a patient or a caregiver who has some could donate it because they are not a registrant. They are not a, a, a medical marijuana establishment registrant. Mm-hmm. And the raffle could happen that way. Okay. Well, so I mean, it, it just, it, it basically it's who's doing it. So uh, I, my, my clarification was simply, uh, this is not something, it's not something that's going to be in effect this year. But as the years go on, uh, the uh, medical marijuana establishments don't want to be in the business of donating this type of thing. However, uh, individuals most certainly are not prohibited from doing uh, that sort of thing uh, vis-a-vis their registration because they're not registered. There might be other issues in the state statute that affect their capacity to do that, but it wouldn't cost any uh, it wouldn't cost any dispensary or production facility or cultivation facility. Uh, their registration for a patient or caregiver themselves to do that. Well, okay. Um, we have our Hemp Fest winner um, on the line. Dennis? Yes, how you doing? Uh, we're doing great. Thank hey, you Dennis. for calling in. Hey, Dennis. Yeah, luckily my phone was not working out here in Pahrump. They kind of hit a fiber optic line and a lot of phone lines are down right now. Well, it came up just in time for you to get your Hempfest tickets. Yeah, it did. <laughs> well, I, you're hosting a, a patient's first meeting in Pahrump now uh, this Saturday, aren't you? Yes, it'll be this Saturday at 2 o'clock at the, at the Pahrump Diner. Well, right on. And so you're also... A little more than welcome for all, you know, all the patients to come, the new patients, and uh, anybody that's interested that needs information, they're welcome to come and get more information about how to get their cards and who to go to and where to go about to get it at. And I'll post that information on our and Facebook also page and website. And we're having a fall, fe- the fall festivals out here in Pahrump, too. All right. So there, it's, it's the fall festival there, so. out in Pahrump, and, and that's kind of a big deal in Pahrump. Also, they have a really big uh, fall festival, and you can go to a patient's first meeting in Pahrump. All right, we're going to be going into it. Thank you, Dennis, for calling in, and we're going to be going into a break. And when we get back, we have Shay on the phone to talk a little bit more about HempFest. Do you need help getting your Nevada medical marijuana card? Dr. Reefer is now accepting new patients. There are no medical records required. We have a doctor on staff to give you a thorough physical examination. There is a 99% approval rate for patients. They also have a money-back guarantee. If you don't qualify, you don't pay. Free consultation is available. Call 702-428-0000. 702-428-0000 to get your Nevada medical marijuana card today. Locally owned and operated TSI Total Safety Incorporated has kept our community safe since 1998. We provide superior services offering professional installation, local fire and burglar alarm monitoring, and the fastest response times in Las Vegas. We also offer armed and unarmed security, video security systems, access control, and fire safety installation and service. All of your security needs are covered. Call us at 702-967-0000 That's 702-967-0000 or visit us at tsivegas.com. Green Spot Hydroponics is a Las Vegas-based distributor of specialty indoor and outdoor gardening supplies. Locally owned and operated with over 3,000 square feet of inventory. Expert and friendly staff to help you with all your growing and hydroponic needs. Our pricing and service will not be beat. We help you grow. 3355 Westlake Mead Boulevard, just behind the Texas station. Mention we can and receive 10% off. Call us at 702-463-6000. That's 702-463-6000. 
All right. Thank you. And um, welcome back. This is Jennifer with Nevada's Cannabis News. And we have Shay on the phone from Hemp Fest. Welcome, Shay. Hi, Jen. How you doing? I'm really, I'm really good. How are you? Oh, fantastic. Getting excited about the festival. It's, it's coming, coming up. up, man. It's coming up um, quick. It, it is. And we have numerous speakers. Um, we're really trying to focus this around the community and education. And we have some phenomenal speakers coming in, um, which include, you know, Sierra Riddle and um, the uh, Lynette Shaw. And it's going to be hosted by John Davis and Jeannie Herrera. So it's going to be a great time. It's October 4th. Mm -hmm. That's great. It's going to be October 4th. And, and what time does it open? It actually opens at 10 a.m. Uh, performances start at 11. And it, it closes at midnight. So we have 14 hours of fun ahead of us. Wow. Okay, so um, it's at Clark County Amphitheater. Are you allowed to bring anything in, like a big umbrella, so that you can sit out on the lawn, or a cooler, or, or something like that? Um, what What are the rules? Well, um, basically, what we're gonna what we're going to do is um, all food, all food, and you know, backpacks and everything are going to be checked thoroughly for safety. And um, the food's not going to be allowed in because we are going to have some delicious vendors coming out to uh, uh, please our palate. Okay. Got any um, pizza from L.A. by chance? I'm sorry? <laughs> Got any pizza from L.A. by chance? Any pizza from L.A.? Yeah, they were no. they were, we were talking earlier about an L.A. guy that puts about a dime bag in each pizza. 250 milligrams per six-inch pizza. Oh, wow. Interesting. Interesting. No, so none of that yeah. kind of pizza. Okay, Smarty. Yeah, yeah. No, no, none, of that, none of that kind of pizza, unfortunately. Um, we are in Clark County, and we have to be aware of where, where we're at. Yep. So, um, but, yeah, as far as that goes, um, as far as chairs and umbrellas and all that, um, what we're really trying to do is we're really trying to focus on safety. So there will be plenty of seating. Um, you'll be more than welcome to bring, you know, soft blankets or something of that nature. But we're really trying to focus on safety and make sure that this is a successful and safe event. And it's all ages, so we have a new, we have a, a wide demographic to actually appeal to and and uh, take care of. Okay, so um, no camp chairs, uh, no um, no big umbrellas, stuff like that. But you can bring a blanket in to take care of those type of needs. Uh, no food, no coolers. There are going to be um, vendors out there selling. Um, it's an all ages event, and so everybody can come down and have fun with the family. Exactly, and that's and and you know, I feel that it's imperative, especially in our community. Um, a lot of times, uh, people don't realize that we're family people. We are. Um, we're probably some some uh, just because we're patients doesn't mean that you know we're not family people. And for and for us, we really wanted to focus on the fact that you know cannabis is one of those things that is not only beneficial to people over the age of 18, but there are numerous numerous children that I'm sure you've talked about numerous times that have benefited from the medicinal uses. That is true, and that is true. Not only that, um, not only that, but we we are family-oriented people being cannabis patients you're right that some of those patients could be under 18 as well but uh, the fact of the matter is is that most of the people that are patients are are not only family oriented but they do a lot of stuff with their families um, it's not like you know um, it, you know it's not like going out to EDC where I don't think that I would bring my family uh, for sure, this is more of a family-friendly event, um, and it's got the hours and the speakers and and the interest. Um, the music, the comedy. Music, comedy, speakers. So it does have a wide variety of activities uh, that are going on that would be family-friendly um, and and oriented towards uh, you know having your family out there for a certain maybe amount of time, and then you could you know send them home with the grandparents and and you know listen to more concerts at night for sure absolutely and that is you know and that's one of the things too is that you know with everything progressing it's the same um you know for pa for patients particularly and you know even just hemp as a viable resource um people are uh tr they tend to um think that you know we're not that 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 we you know that we're still living in the the proverbial green closet and for us, 
I feel like hemp and cannabis as medicine, it's not something that just needs to be discussed, you know, in the just say no rate, rate uh, just say no era, and they, um, you know, you know, discuss to talk to your children about drugs type of scenario. This is something that you know, education starts young, and our most impressionable minds on, are are usually the ones. That, the best, best best education starts as young as possible, and that's that. That's the exposure is that we're trying to forward the movement with forward thinkers and be able to expand upon what we are what we're already building. Absolutely, Shay. Um, now you need to. Um, there are a few things. Do you have booths ava- available for vendors? Or are those like closing fast? Because last they, time I well, talked to you, there were like maybe eight left or something. Well, we actually are down to, um, we're actually down to, to, to four left, should anybody want to get them. And I, I don't foresee them being here within the next three days. So if there's any listeners out there that need, still need their vendor booth, please act quickly. Um, as far as, you know, and it, the thing is, is you know, every, everything is being, the, uh, as far as food and everything, you know, we have a wide variety to please every palate. Um, but yeah, it's, as far as retail vendors, we have about four spots left. Okay, so if you want your retail vendor spot, you uh, you need to get hold uh, of somebody at Fe- at Hempfest, and you can get a hold of them through www. Is it Las Vegas Hempfest? Yes, www.lasvegashempfest.com. Um, we also have an event page on Facebook, um, and then also too for your listeners, there's going to be a couple events that. We are going to, there's going to be a couple opportunities for people that maybe cannot afford it to win win tickets. So I want your listeners to stay tuned to that. All right. Um, we, ha- we had our um, giveaway for that. Uh, if there's going to be a remote or anything else, uh, do you know the date and time maybe? Um, we are, the, the, there is a, there's a date and time are going to be, be revealed. Um, oh, okay. And you will get all that information shortly. Um, but I'm trying to, you know, let everyone know that there are going to be more opportunities to win tickets. Um, there's going to be a chance to win some VIP passes. I mean, there are some, there's some nice giveaways coming. And we'll, uh, we'll have another chance to win some tickets uh, this Sunday at our pool party also. Yes, absolutely. The pool party, we were, I was just about to say, um, at Weekend's pool, uh, monthly pool party. I believe this is the last one, right, Jen? This is the last one of the season, Shay. Wow, congratulations to another successful season. Um, But yeah, so there's going to be a chance to do that as well. Um, I was very happy to, I was very happy that at the normal picnic um, that there were, I saw somebody was able to win a pair as well. Yeah, yeah, we uh, we took a pair of uh, the tickets that you gave us for a radio show giveaway, and we donated those there. So I hope you weren't upset about that. <laughs> well, that's why I was plugging. I was plugging you into that because um, that was phenomenal for you guys to be able to to promote like that. That was thank you so much. Yeah, there was a great turnout there with a lot of people. So you know, we wanted to make sure that you guys got your plug and that everyone heard of Hempfest. And man, did the winner of those tickets get excited! I think that was, it was like she won the grand prize. <laughs> It was. You know, I think she screamed, I, screamed louder than I did. <laughs> you know, and the thing was is like, and that's and that's what it's about. Is I mean, a lot of the the giveaways and everything. It's about to make sure that everybody in the community, if they want to participate, they are going to be there and see this because this is history for us. We have worked very hard and very long to be able to get to this point, and I feel that you know, every every nook and cranny of the community should be there. For sure. All right. Thank you, Shay, for calling in. And uh, we've got about a minute to make our local announcements here. Uh, an- another successful uh, weekend radio radio show. And uh, we're going to see you at the pool party on Sunday. We have, uh, what, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock? 3 o'clock. 3 p.m. at our pool party. You can find all the information at Facebook on weekend 702 that's our website we also have a camp out uh planned for friday saturday sunday and monday into monday and saturday is our patients first meeting at perump so we have a new patients first meeting to meet uh to meet the needs of everybody in the perump community in the nye county uh with all of that we'll see you be safe everybody 